Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Mr. Bo Billingsley. Hello, hello, hi, hello. all you space cowboys. <laughs> Did you have your bell peppers and beef yet? And we have a lovely member of our crew in the yellow shirt here with a microphone. So if you've got questions, go ahead and raise your hands. Uh, I'm going to kick things off with a couple of things uh, to get us going, but we are here because of you, the fans. So if you've got stuff, don't be shy. Um, one of the things in your, in your biography that I think affects your filmography uh, is uh, you're, you're a military veteran. Uh, you, uh, you were in the military, do I have it right, before you started going into training as an actor? Uh, or are they approximately I simultaneous? Actually, I started before. Just before, yeah, okay. Yeah, I started um, acting in college. Uh, I didn't study acting. I figured, you know, it's acting, how hard can it be, you know? So I just went out there and, and did it. I did a play uh, when I was in college, and then, you know, I went on to law school, and then I, I, um, uh, I started actually while I was in law school. I would go down to New York, and uh, I did some stuff. I did some, a soap opera, and then I went into the military, and I did a few plays in the military. And that's when I made, a, I made a decision that I was going to do this for a living. And uh, so when I got out, I was uh, in, in Germany for about four years, and I went to San Francisco, and then I went to Hollywood and started my career. And I was very lucky to have had a certain amount of success. Do you feel like your, your military training is something that's helped you in the business itself, whether it's just the way that sets are run, you know, knowing, knowing how to ask for what you need to ask for and advocate for yourself as a performer? Well, one of the things the military did for me is gave me a sense of discipline and stick with itness. You know, one of the things you have to have is uh, determination if you go into show business, whether it's on camera acting or voice acting, uh, because there's a lot of rejection no matter how successful you are there's still a lot of rejection, so you have to be able to manage your life that way. And I, of course, I had a family, and I had to, I had to figure out a way to support uh, my family. You know, my kids felt like they had to eat every day. You know, I don't know what that's about, but, um, yeah, it, uh, that's the influence that the military had on me, is to, to teach me to, to, be, um, to persevere and to stick with it. And to, when you get knocked down, to get back up. And, and keep fighting, you know, and that's what you should do in, no matter what area of life you are in. You know, we all have ups and downs, so we figure out a way to, uh, to keep on moving forward. You know. Now, a lot of people out here, big fans of Cowboy Bebop. Jet Black is, uh, is a big part of why people are fans of this show. Uh, a lot of people here are fans of a lot of different characters, a lot of different shows and properties and all that kind of stuff. I'm curious about what, what you were a fan of growing up. What, you know, what was it for you as a kid? That was that was fun for you. If if you were you know coming out to an event like this as a fan, who would you want to meet? What you know what shows were were a big influence on you? Movies even. Um, the voices of the cartoons, you know, um, Road Runner, Popeye, uh, Donald Duck, Mighty Mouse. Here I am to save the day. And um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Growing up, I pretty much thought of myself, my self-vision was as an athlete. Um, and uh, I, had, I was offered a contract to play professional baseball when I uh, graduated from high school. And when I graduated from college, I was, uh, got some letters from the, the, the NFL, the National Football League. Um, so the acting kind of came later in, 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 my, in my concept of, of myself. And, uh, but well, I remember when, you know, I went on to law school and I practiced law for a little bit, and I remember I, when I talked to my dad about uh, changing professions, becoming an actor, and he told me, he said, well, you've been acting a fool all of your life, you might as well get paid for it. So, <laughs> that's, that's how that went. But, um, yeah, the, um, the, the, the decision to become a, a professional actor came late in life. You know, some a lot of people, they, they know what they want to do early in their life, and they, they study, they go to college, and they take acting classes and, and like that, and uh, I didn't do that. I, when I went to New York to start my career, I hadn't studied at all, and I just figured, uh, and you know, I can, I can do this. <laughs> you know? And I faked it for a long time, and then finally I took classes and I studied. Um, but, you know, you can only go so far 
<laughs> pretending. <laughs> Now, one of your credits uh, that, uh, that relates to one of my big fandoms, I love the Final Fantasy games, uh, and you gave, you gave English language voice to, uh, to uh, Barrett uh, in, in Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the biggest mistake that they did with the remake game <laughs> is they didn't call you back up and see what you were up to. Uh, but, but as for you know, the way that it was presented to you when, when you got the, the offer to, to play him in Advent Children, uh, did you have any familiarity with the franchise at all? What was, I mean, how, how did it strike you? Here, you're going to play this guy with a, a gun for an arm. Well, I thought it was really cool to have a gun for an arm. I'd love to have a gun for an arm, you know. Um, but, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed voicing Barrett. It was a lot of fun, and the other actors are wonderful um, in Final Fantasy uh, Advent Children. Um, and, you know, people ask me about my attitude about having been replaced. You know, they replaced the whole cast. Um, it was disappointing, but it's one of those things that takes place in, in our business. And so there are times when um, you have big disappointments, but you have to move on. Um, there are one of the uh, conciliatory aspects of that is that the whole cast was replaced. It wasn't just me. So, so um, you you weren't the problem. They just no, decided I to I, do a new thing. <laughs> right. I wasn't. I wasn't the problem. Um, but um, yeah, I, 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 they make their decisions on how they're going to go with the franchise, and it is what it is. Uh, there are um, some um, projects that I did that I was like Dynasty Warriors. I, I voiced Kao Ren, who became Sao Ren, and Dion Wei for years and years and years, and then they did the same thing. They replaced the cast. And um, you know, when you voice a character, it is, it, you know, he becomes part of you. And, um, and then if you, do a, you voice a character for a long period of time and then they replace you and somebody else does it, it's, it's a weird feeling. It's like, no, he's mine. Don't, don't say those words. Those are, those are my words to say. But, you know, as I say, you, we, have no, we don't have any input in that decision as a voice actor, so we just have to go with what, what the decisions are as they're made and, and move on with our lives. We have any questions out there from you guys? Anybody? Let's let's go right here to you in the purple. Whoops. Um, hello. So there we go. Um, I want to ask, uh, which one of the colleagues you worked with that voiced um, Cowboy Bebop do you think is the most similar to the character they voiced? Oh, this is a dangerous one. Wow. You want me to, you want me to pick, pick somebody? <laughs> well, let I mean, me if you see. Pick, if you pick Mary, I mean, woo, that's got some <laughs> implications. Well, you know it. what? I think they all are. They all are. They all match the characters. Uh, Wendy Lee and Melissa and, and Steve and Mary as Julia. Um, I think the, the casting was just absolutely spot on. And I can't really imagine any other voices voicing those characters. And um, just so you know, we've become a family. We did the series in 1998 and we did the, um, the movie in 2000. And we still you know, communicate with each other. We have an open text conversation that is never ending. Uh, we've been texting each other this week, actually. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the Bebop family, and we always will be, and I think they're all fabulous, and no way would I think that somebody is better than somebody else. <laughs> but, uh, but thanks for your question. Next up. Oh, right there. Uh, when did it hit you that Bebop actually became like a cult classic phenomenon? When did it hit you guys? You know, when we first did it, we, didn't, we had no idea what was going to happen with it. We, I didn't even know what it was. Uh, I was called and asked to do it, and, you know, I just listened to the title. I heard the title of Cowboy Bebop, and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to play cowboy. Okay, I, can, I love to play a cowboy. And as a matter of fact, in the first, my first session with Mary... Uh, we were determining what type of voice that Jet would have. 
And um, so I was thinking, like, I talk like that, you know, because he's a cowboy. And so Mary said, no, 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 I don't think we're going to go that way. She said, let's go out on a limb and, like, use your voice and tweak it a little bit. And of course, my thought was, that's boring. I want to do some special voice like that, maybe. But um, so, yeah, we ended up using my voice. And as time went on, uh, you know, because we didn't, we didn't see the whole series. It, whenever we would go in to do a, a recording session, you know, we were individual in the booth. We weren't in together. And Mary would have to give us uh, an explanation of what was going on in that particular episode and, and what had happened just before we started voicing our, you know, our character. Um, but we had no idea that it would have the impact that it ha has had um, in, our, in our universe. Um, I, I remember when I first heard some of the music, I was really taken by that, I, thinking that, wow, this is some awesome music. When I heard Tank, I mean, there's nothing like Tank, right? Um, so, and then we start, you know, we start talking, because like when, if Steve was going in, I would come early and I'd watch him a little bit, and then I'd, I'd, I'd voice, he'd voice his thing, and then I'd do my thing, and sometimes he'd hang back and we'd chat. And, uh, and that was back when we were using paper, you know. You guys remember paper? <laughs> we, we weren't using pads or anything like we do now. So um, Steve, I remember one time Steve left a note in the script by one of my loops. He said, hey, Bo, Jet sucks. And so I went for, far further into the script where he, where he hadn't voiced yet and when he was going to come in. And I, I wrote back, I said, hey, Steve. Spike sucks, and the bebop is my ship. <laughs> and so he got, he, got a, he got a big kick out of that. Um, but as time went on, you know, we, we still didn't know until it, in the, until it started airing. And I actually saw it, you know, because you don't really see what you're doing until it's, it's over. You go in, you do your loops, and that's what it is. And, um, but then once, once I saw it and heard the music, I was thinking, there. This is this is something very special, um, but you know, and, and as time went on, it, 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 its its uh, impact grew. It came on on um, Adult Swim and um, on uh, Cartoon Network, and then that that's when it really really went big, and helped to put anime on the map in um, in the, the Western Hemisphere. Um, but we had no idea. Uh, it would have the impact that it has, has had when we were actually uh, voicing our characters. Thank you for that question. That's a, a good question. You got one right there? Um, how often do you have people telling you that Cowboy Bebop was their first anime? I'm sorry, did... How often do you have people tell, tell you that Cowboy Bebop was their first anime? Oh, <laughs> a lot. Yeah, a lot, people... yeah, a lot of people say that. That's a good question. Um, it's kind of like the gateway anime for some people. It, it has been. It, it was the, uh, someone, this is the story I get a lot, that someone watched Cowboy Bebop and they, they thought it was awesome and they introduced it to one of their friends and then, you know, and it would spread like that and spread like that. And then once they uh, enjoyed Cowboy Bebop, then they started going on to other things. And so it's, it's been, I've heard that story many, many times that, um, they were introduced to Cowboy Bebop, and after that, uh, they, they spread it. It grew like a tree, and people were passing, it, passing the word and passing the word, and the, and the fans were um, helping us, helping our franchise to grow. And, uh, and, and then we did the movie, and I don't know if you're aware, we actually voiced Cowboy Bebop the game, but uh, it, it, never came, it never came here. Which was a real sadness because we were really looking forward to uh, forward to the game. More questions? We got one right here. Oh, sure, it's okay. Uh, hi, Bo. Hello. Uh, before I ask my question, I just wanted to say that uh, I mean I'm a huge anime fan, and uh, I really love you know retro anime, older anime from you know the eight, 90s, 80s even, and I usually watch them. Uh, with the original voice actors, like sub, right? But Cowboy Bebop is one of the few anime I actually prefer the dub version, and it's in huge part because of you. Uh, I really like uh, you you playing uh, Jet Black, so uh, thank you for that. 
And my question is, um, you mentioned earlier about being rep the cast being replaced for uh, FF7 uh, Advent. And um, I want to ask you uh, how you feel about being replaced again in the, in the movie, like uh, someone else playing your role. Uh, of the, the, the Netflix series, you yes. mean? Yeah, sorry, yeah, the Netflix series, yeah. Oh, the, the, the live they, action. They didn't call you up to do the stunts for Jet, no. <laughs> for Netflix. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, of a certain age. I wouldn't be doing the, uh, those stunts. Um, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very happy with the cast that they chose, uh, as, as far as I can tell. Um, I saw the trailer, and the trailer looked really, really, really good. Uh, it was kind of campy, and I, I thought it was enjoyable. So I'm looking forward to seeing the live action. Uh, version of Cowboy Bebop, and I think it's the way I understand it. It's going to be um, an artistic endeavor on its own. That they're not going to be doing our our sessions or our episodes. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. And so that um, it isn't that they aren't necessarily replacing us, but they're doing a different version of Cowboy Bebop. And I think I'm hoping that it will generate more interest for Cowboy Bebop the animation. The, the anime, um, that maybe it will help more people become uh, familiar and, and to watch the anime if they watch the live action, uh, the live action version. I'm really excited to see it, and uh, and I'm enjoying the the new energy that has come uh, come come about because of the live action and bringing more interest to uh, to the anime. You know, one of the things that I find most interesting from the little bits of the performances that we've gotten to see is that it's very clear that the performances are informed by your voice performances in the dub, not imitations of them, but there's definitely, there, there's definitely like a feeling of the character uh, that, that you lent to Jet in, in your, your live action counterpart's uh, performance. I mean, there, there's the sensation of you know, seeing you know, Barrett voiced by somebody else and that's weird. In, in this case, what, what was it like seeing, seeing Jet dialogue coming out of this guy's mouth for the first time? It was just very strange. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what to say. It's, um, this is the first time, uh, a first time experience for me to see uh, a character that I voiced in anime be um, portrayed by a live action person. Um, as I say, um, I, I'm not too familiar with the actor who, voice, who portrays Jet, but I'm sure they made a good choice. And Watanabe-san is was when I understand is has been a technical advisor on the live action so that I mean it's this is his baby so I'm I feel that he's going to do everything he can to protect uh, his 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 um, his baby to protect the franchise and um, the, the music is, is done by the same composer um, so I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of reminders of the anime and uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see it. I, I, I can't wait. We've just got a few short weeks to wait. Yeah, I know. It's coming, I think, November 19th. November 19th, I think. 19th I yeah, think, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I hope you all are going to tune in and, and check it out. Still got some time left. We got a question there. Go for it. Yes, hi. Um, I was just curious. Um, you got such an iconic role. After you received that role, did you find it easier to get others in kind of the voice acting field? I know it's very competitive. Was your question is would that this help me get other roles? Yeah, once you got Jet, was it easier to get other oh, roles? In oh, the yes, yes. Well, back when we did it, you know, the voiceover world was pretty small in in, in Hollywood, um, and so like I didn't audition for Jet, and I don't think I auditioned for Raikage for uh, from Naruto, uh, or for Digimon uh, Ogreman in, in Digimon. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Digimon, um, but I voiced um, uh, Ogreman, Parrotman, Sagittarian, Ohuraman. I tried to get them to do a, a Jamaican man, but they, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't buy it. You know, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the uh, Jet voicing Jet did help me become even more known in the voice world. But back then, it was so small that. Uh, so much of it was just word of mouth. I get a call, so you want to do a, you want to do a thing, and I say, yeah. Um, I did this anime called Legend of Black Heaven. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. it didn't didn't take off, obviously, but I voiced uh, a character who was saving the universe with his music. 
So I got to go, you know, play my, uh, my electric guitar and save the world. But yeah, I think it, 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 definitely, it definitely helped. Uh, I think that was Mary Elizabeth's first directing gig. And that was, I think that was Steve Bloom's first lead, lead role. So I think it helped all of our careers because it became such an iconic um, uh, project, or, uh, piece of art, because it really is a piece of art. And the detail that Watanabe, Watanabe uh, delved into, to, you can see that it was, it was made for the, um, the Western culture, and specifically the United States culture, uh, in, in the music and, and the, the, the references, so that he had a vision that, like, I think, so many um, artists around the world, they want to get their, their product to the Western Hemisphere, the United States and Canada. Um, so he did a great job in uh, tailoring it to our culture because it wasn't a big success right away in Japan. Uh, but uh, they had to follow our lead here in, in the West to, to, uh, to, to recognize what a, a special piece of art uh, it, it is. And I think that uh, it, it has uh, made a tremendous contribution to my life uh, by my interaction with you guys, uh, because um, to hear your stories about how you became involved with Cowboy Bebop uh, and how it has affected your life um, is, is really heartwarming. And um, because, I mean, it's all about you guys. It's all about the fans. You know, without you guys, we, got, we, we don't have a career. So your wonderful reaction to our work, and especially Cabo Bebop, um, is something that will always live in my heart. And I know what the, the other actors, with Steve and Mary and, and Wendy and Melissa, um, I mean, we, we're always constantly referring to your reactions uh, to um, how Cowboy Bebop affected your lives, and that's what we—that's what we love to hear. If you, if you come to my table, I'd love to hear your, I love to hear your your stories about how you got involved in Cowboy Bebop and how it has affected your life. Because I, I love to just love to hear your hear your stories. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody's here for, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you, Space Cowboys and Cowgirls. <laughs> <laughs> Next up. Uh, hello. I just wanted to say that Cowboy Bebop stands on its own, and um, you specifically, or your character, Jet, was uh, my favorite in the show, and it really did help sort of bring anime into my life. It was only the third, sh third anime that I ever watched, so um, I wanted to thank you for that. And I guess my question is, to me, Cowboy Bebop always felt a little incomplete, or that um, there definitely was a lot more story to tell. And I was wondering if you would ever be willing, or if there was ever any talk of doing any kind of reunion episode or anything like that. Yeah, there's been talk amongst the, the voice actors because we didn't want it to stop. <laughs> we were all um, devastated when we realized that, you know, it was ending, you know, it was ending with the movie that, you know, and you know how the movie ended. So, um, I mean, we were all were in tears. Uh, it was such a, it's, it was such a well-written, well-composed um, project that we would have been happy to do it forever. But... And we tried to get word to Watanabe-san to, to please, you know, bring us more, bring us more, bring us more. And his concept was he wanted to leave the audience wanting more and just move on. And uh, sadly, that's what he did. So I'm thinking that the live action will be, it's not exactly what we wanted as the voice actors, but it's better than nothing, right? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, First of all, I just want to say uh, Cowboy Bebop is still the only anime that I watch dubbed because I love you guys' voice. They're the best. Um, you, uh, you put a big emphasis on music. I know that in 2020 you guys did a uh, sort of online collaboration for a Tank special. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that involvement? I really love that video. That oh, was that, was, that was for the, um, the charity? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, we were approached by that. Steve and I were approached by that uh, to do that. 
And obviously, you know, when someone wants to uh, ask us to do something for charity, we're always ready to do it. And so um, if, I think that was, we had done uh, some live readings for charity when they had the, the tsunami in, in, in Japan. But um, doing that video was, uh, was awesome. And the music, I mean, there were such talented people in that, that video. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but um, it was just a very, it was very flattering to be asked to do it. And we were uh, very happy at the response. So we were able to raise quite a bit of money, I think fifty or $60,000. Uh, so um, yeah, that was a very unique project. And I'm very, very happy that uh, I was asked to partici participate in it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we got more questions. Got folks right over here. Y'all all right sitting on the floor? Wow. <laughs> uh, hey, Bo. Um, hey. Uh, I guess I just wanted to ask, uh, with the new casting, um, I mean, if this movie coming out now, I guess I would have never thought um, in the 90s representation, it just changed a bit. And the character of Jet being played by a black actor, I thought was awesome. <laughs> the whole like, choice behind that. Um, I guess I'm asking if, for you to reflect on, I don't know how the industry has changed. I, I'm honestly asking on like an optimistic way. Like it's kind of cool how representation has evolved <laughs> in the showbiz. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts? And the on the, the evolution of, of diverse casting, representation, yeah. diverse casting, media, yes. and so on. Well, I'm, I'm very happy that it, it has evolved as it has. It's maybe, maybe a little late, um, but I better think late than never, right? Better late than never. And I, I think that we, we try to go for authenticity in our art, and I think that that's one of the, one of the ways to um, extend that. If, if there is a, an, an Indian American uh, character in, um, in, a, in, a, in a project, it makes sense to cast an Indian American uh, actor. And uh, so that the possibilities for, for voice actors uh, of, of, of color to participate in the business has really grown a lot. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy for that. Uh, you know, when I first started, um, and, and my career continued that way, that I wasn't limited by being uh, an African-American person. Uh, like that OG in uh, Legend of Black Heaven was, was not an African-American. Um, the, the fourth Raikage is not an African-American. Uh, and Jet, he's... He's gray-skinned, right? <laughs> I think Jed is gray. I don't know if you call him a, a, a POC or not. But um, I think that the integration of society into our world, the voiceover world, is really good. I think the, the, the anime and the voice world should reflect what society looks like. And I think that's a, that's a, really, that's a really good thing so that young people uh, of, of all races, all colors, can, can see someone that looks like them um, in a project, whether it's animation or if it's, uh, whether it's live, live action, to see someone who looks like them, to say, well, maybe I could do that too. And, um, you know, it's, uh, life is continuing, continually evolving, and I, I'm, I like to think in a good way, although you know, the last four or five years have been kind of rough in, in, in the United States. Um, but um, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how, how the anime, the voiceover world has evolved and in, 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 in becoming more inclusive of everybody who lives in this world. That's a good question. Thank you. Who else has one? Anybody else? Let me see hands record. Oh, we got one way back there. Making you get your steps in. <laughs> get some steps. Get some <laughs> steps. And eat your bell peppers and beef. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bore you to death with that. 
<laughs> it never gets old. That's the thing. No, it doesn't. Um, I was just wondering, in the show, uh, Jet seems to take almost like a motherly role to like some of the characters. Did that come kind of like naturally to you, or did you kind of like fit into that over time? Oh, it came naturally for me. I, I look, I look at it as a, as a fatherly role because you know I have a son and a daughter, and uh, my my daughter is um, three years older than my son, and uh, I dealt, you know, they're. They're growing. I'm a grandfather now, so you know, it was years and years ago. But I, I dealt with their shenanigans, and and uh, Jet on the bebop had to deal with the especially Faye, Faye's shenanigans. Um, so yeah, I, I I felt really comfortable coming into that role and dealing with dealing with those two scoundrels um, or, or rascals or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they tested me a lot, uh, but. Um, yeah, I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed that aspect of Jet's character and, and his, his uh, fake or faux macho, you know, he's always talking about, I don't care about them, I don't need them, you know, I, just me and I, and I don't care, Ed, I, that's fine, Faye and Spike can go on and do what they want to do, and I don't know if you remember that uh, session where they, they left and, and I was... Uh, just sitting there talking to Ayn and talking about, I don't care if they're, and I, I heard a noise and I, I thought it might have been Spike coming back. And so I said, is Spike? Is that you, Spike? All excited and, and I turned into a little boy. And of course it wasn't Spike, but I, I love the way that he was written so that he would have that vulnerabil vulnerability uh, to, uh, to, to be human as opposed to, there's so many characters that are written without vulnerability and uh, almost too macho. You know, the, the, the macho aspect of, of, of a character is, is good and exciting, but uh, I love to play characters that are vulnerable. Any more hands? Any more questions out there? Oh, right yes. There. Okay. Howdy. <laughs> howdy. Howdy. How you doing? I'm doing good. You? I'm doing great, Space Cowboy. Right. So uh, I was trying to inspire to be a voice actor myself, and I was wondering what were some of the challenges that you had to come, like, overcome as a voice actor yourself? Well, one of the challenges is, for, for me in my career, I've done a lot of uh, uh, characters with big voices and big fights, and, and so it's a physical challenge. I don't, I don't know if you all are aware of the orcs. You're aware of the orcs and the World of Warcraft, and... Uh, I did some I did some orcs, uh, some walla for orcs, and you know the orcs are beasts, so they're not supposed to sound human at all. So the challenge would be not to hurt yourself. Uh, the orcs are, and so that's fun to do, unless you're doing it for eight hours, <laughs> and uh, and no matter you know how you how much training you've had in saving your voice, it's going to affect you so that when we do, I, I voice a character like that, um, my voice changes, and so I'm down for like two or three days because I can't audition because I wouldn't be able to replicate that voice because I'm talking down here like that, even though that's not my regular voice. So uh, that has been the basic challenge for me in my, in my path as a voice actor because uh, when you voice the, the big voice um, monsters and bad guys, uh, they want you to grovel around in your bowels when you're trying to, trying to talk. Um, and actually we had an issue with that when, when we were um, about to go on strike because the producers didn't understand that uh, a four hour session on Wednesday would shut me down till the following Monday and um, so it's even though it's a four-hour session, it's literally like a three-day gig because uh, it takes a while for the voice to come back to where it, it normally rests. And so your vocal cords or your vocal bands can vibrate and, and produce the sound that you're normally known for. So, um, um, and the other challenge for me, you know, I started my career as an on-camera actor and that I had to uh, condition myself to use basically just my voice 
to help move the story along as opposed to my body. You know, different characters I play, there's different body language. My characters walk differently, uh, talk differently. So um, uh, that was one of the challenges for me coming from the, the uh, on-camera world. And when I first started, we didn't have beeps. You know, in, in our world, we have three beeps. Uh, and we speak where the fourth beep is, and we breathe where the second beep is. So it's like this, it's beep, breathe, beep, speak. And when I first started out, there were no beeps, so all we had was time codes. And so we had to chase the scene and, and watch the time code know when to start. But now with the engineering uh, and with the Pro Tools, they can slide things, compress things, expand things, so it's a lot easier for voice actors. But uh, those were the challenges that I, I experienced when I first started. Any other hands out there? I got a couple things to wrap us up with, but I want to make sure that if anybody else there, out there has a question, we get you. Anybody? Anybody? Right over here. We're really making you jog today. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do for a living. Talk. <laughs> uh, hey, am I coming through OK? Yep. Yes, you are. Thank you very much. So I was wondering from um, a voice actor's perspective, what goes into character creation for you? What kind of notes do you look for and what kind of notes do you take? Well, the, any actor, voice actor or on-camera actor, you try to find a connection with your, per, yourself, with the, with, the, with the character that you're, you're voicing. Um, so that's, that's the first step. Uh, and we don't necessarily think about ourselves doing a voice, we're, we're portraying a character. Um, but, the, you know, the, the most fun characters for me have been characters that are completely different for me. Um, like um, doing a character, I did a, I did a, a, Cajun, a Cajun dog in a, in a, in a project. So um, I talk like that, you know. You know, like the people are down around New Orleans. And uh, so doing a character like that, I really enjoy it because I'm getting out of myself and I'm talking like somebody else. And so I look in the mirror and I talk and talk and talk and it's like I'm talking to somebody else. I'm not even seeing myself. Um, so, uh, but the bottom line is to try to find the similarities. And like with Jet, you know, as I explained the similarities, I'm a father and, um, and blah, 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 blah. And I have a very macho background playing football and all of that, but uh, being vulnerable is, is um, is a very important aspect of a character. I think that most actors try to find the vulnerability in that, in that, in that character, uh, where his feelings are, and uh, to, 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 to balance, balance him out, because so many characters, especially the characters that I voice, are, are macho guys, you know. And, um, and so, much, so much macho, even in real life, it's a, it's a facade, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a put on, uh, and it kind of reflects the person's vision of themselves. Uh, so that's why a lot of times, especially men, uh, have difficulty being vulnerable um, in, their, in their personal life. But that's what I, that's what I, I look for, the vulnerability in, in a character. And if, if, I, if I can find it and place it in there, if, if it's not already there, that's what I, that's what I go for. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your question completely, but uh, that, that those, are my, those are my thoughts on that. I did want to mention that um, people ask me about my favorite episodes of Cowboy Bebop, and obviously uh, Ganymede uh, Elegy, when Jet goes back to his roots and goes back to his girlfriend and puts that aspect of his life um, to rest and tosses the watch into the water. Uh, but I also enjoy um, uh, Mushroom Samba. I, I, you remember that episode? I never thought I'd, I'd get a chance to do a, to voice a character who was stoned in, 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 in anime. And do you remember when Jet was talking to his bonsai trees? <laughs> and, uh, and at one point he blurts out, who, who, who am I anyway? Uh, I, I, really, I really had a, a lot of fun uh, uh, doing, doing, that, doing that episode. Well, to, to, uh, to wrap us up, one of the things that, that, you, uh, that you touched on was having to advocate for yourselves as performers and go, look, this is what is and is not reasonable to expect of us. This is what it does to us. This is what we need just to be able to get in there and do the work. 
uh, it, it is in a variety of different directions been a hot topic of conversation about the conditions, the working conditions within the industry. It seems like it's all fun and games. We love the end product, but it's work and mm. it is a workplace. And there are sometimes bean counters that are not as concerned with you having a, a healthy, reasonable standard of living as they are <laughs> making the day, making their time, that kind of thing. To young performers out here who may be intimidated by the notion of standing up for themselves, speaking up, speaking out uh, about uh, things that, that don't seem right, what advice would you give uh, either up-and-coming performers or, or people who are actively working in the business um, when it comes to standing up for yourself in that respect? Um, <clears throat> it's not easy. Uh, I remember I, I was doing a, a live-action movie and I was in a gunfight it was getting late in the day, and, um, and we were hurrying up to get the shot because it was supposed to be a daylight shot, and I was, being, I was being killed, and they put a squib on my side here, and it explodes when, when I'm supposed to get shot. And um, they were rushing around, and I said, well, I need, I need earplugs, you know, earplugs, and they couldn't find earplugs. They said, oh, Bo, come on, you know, and everybody's like 100 people around, you know, uh, who are working on the shoot, and, and I'm holding them up, up from not getting a shot, and so, okay, okay, let's do it, let's do it, and I did it, and for some reason, you know, that, I lost the hearing in my right ear for a week because they didn't have earplugs, and I learned that lesson, you know, nothing like that ever happened again. That was early on in my career, and uh, I felt the pressure of the moment uh, to, to please the director and, and everybody not to hold up to shoot. Uh, but, you know, as you go through life, it's very important for you to stand up for yourself. You can do it. You don't have to do it in an ugly way. Uh, it's not so often what you say, it's how you say it. And so, um, you know, can you just quietly spoken, but just say this is, this is what my requirements are and, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stick with it. Um, but th that was a lesson I learned. Uh, that uh, I, I succumb to the pressure of the moment with all of these people saying, you know, you're, you're holding up the shoot when they didn't do their work to get earplugs for me. So um, in life, you, you, you need to stand up for yourself. And as a man with a family, then I have to stand up for my family, for my wife, for my kids. Um, and that responsibility you know, having been in the military, and you know, I absorb that responsibility very easily. Uh, but uh, do not allow yourself to be victimized by anyone, anyone for any reason. You speak up for yourself and express your, express your your thoughts and your needs and your judgments. But just do it in a, a quiet, polite way, and you'll be surprised uh, how far that'll take you in life and how much respect you will gain because you've stood up for yourself. Tremendous advice. Uh, well, you know, there is that saying, never meet your heroes, and I love that Bo Billingsley is the disproval of that motto. Uh, you're here the rest of the day, yes? You, I am. Are you here I tomorrow am. as well? Yeah, I'll be at my, uh, at my table. Come by and chat. I'd love, love to talk to you. So whether you've gone to see Bo already or not, go by and talk to him. Uh, he will talk your ear off, and that's, that's yeah. part of why we love having him at these shows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple little uh, things, that uh, uh, bits of housekeeping that I wanted to get out of the way. We got more programming up here on this stage and on the other stage on the other side of the wall. Uh, we have an incredible crew, and I think we need to give them a round of applause. Yay, yeah, Vinegar! Because we're running them all over the place with microphones to get your questions. Hey. And let's keep it going once again, everybody, for Mr. Bo Billingsley. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. See you all, Space Cowboys, and eat that bell peppers and beef. <laughs>